it's, you know, sometimes they're like, yeah, sure, that's fine. Sometimes, sometimes not. Um, but sort of the first part of this is really figuring out how do the people in the system begin to work together to, to decide how do we want to use this system um, and what do we have now and how do we change what we have now. Um, but as I said, one of the great things about this is most of the decisions are made locally. Um, we're not talking about necessarily about changing state law, about changing federal law. We're changing about how agencies run um, and how decisions get made. Um, and you can make a lot of different decisions. So um, I'm not going to go into too much into the weeds of this. Um, but when we look at jail populations, there are a bunch of common drivers that we tend to see pretty regularly. Um, arrest and booking for traffic violations and misdemeanors. I'm working in one jurisdiction. We found that a quarter of the people coming into the jail were booked on nothing more serious than a traffic or municipal offense. Um, broken taillight, driving on a suspended license, um, open container, things like that. Um, use of bail schedules and financial bail. There's been a lot of talk now um, about, uh, about bail and the inequities of cash bail. Most of our systems now run, uh, money is basically the gatekeeper into the jail. Um, if you have money you have, and you have committed a very, very serious offense, you can pay that money and you can get out. If you are very poor and you've done nothing more serious than, uh, than trespass um, or drive on a suspended license, um, you're staying in jail um, until you can pay that money. And I think that there's a growing realization that having money make the decision as opposed to some other mechanism of making decision isn't giving anybody the jails that they think are, are just and fair and that they want in their communities. Um, overcharging by prosecutors, inefficient court processing, um, repeat prosecution of people with behavioral health disorders who come in and in and in and in. Um, excessive fines and fees we talked about and violations of probation. But there are lots of different alternatives to all of these things that exist and that communities around the country are putting in place to try and affect um, the people coming into jail based on those factors. So a number of places um, are moving to use broader use of citations instead of arrest. So for misdemeanors, for low-level offenses, instead of arresting you or giving you a ticket and a day to appear in court. Um, crisis intervention teams, which um, you know, police officers are trained to respond to people with mental illness, not by arresting them, but actually being able to defuse the situation, potentially be able to bring them to a triage facility or a mental health facility. Um, risk assessment instruments, which assess people coming, who, are, who have been arrested based on risk of failure to appear and sometimes public safety risk, and make a better decision about how to release people um, who can go out, what kind of help they might need in the community in order um, to be able to come back to court. Um, I didn't put it up here, but um, one of the most important ways you can keep people from not failing to appear in court is actually remind them to go. As it turns out that like court is sort of like the dentist. Nobody really wants to go, but you get that card in the mail and you go, oh, I have to go. Um, and, and reminders, whether they be text reminders or mail reminders, show um, significant impa uh, impact on failure to appear rates in courts. Um, so time standards for case processing, diversion programs, problem solving courts, drug courts. Um, earlier determinations of indigency so that people don't get fines and fees assessed that they're never going to be able to pay um, and alternatives to incarceration. Um, so I want to make this a little bit more real for you um, if I can. This is um, the Orleans Parish Justice Center in New Orleans. And if you know anything about sort of the criminal justice world, you know Louisiana is kind of ground zero for incarceration in this country and therefore in the world. Um, before Hurricane Katrina, the jail in New Orleans held 6,000 people. Um, after Hurricane Katrina, um, the jails um, were destroyed, most of them, and um, what was revealed to people about those jails um, in the course of Hurricane Katrina, I think, woke people up to how horrendous it had been, and so they knew they were going to have to build a new jail, and the question is, how big should this jail be? 
Um, so uh, with a lot of community organizing and community pressure, but also leadership from within government, um, they built a new jail and the new jail has fewer than 1,500 beds. Um, and then, um, and they have created the, the, a system um, that actually doesn't, isn't producing 6,000 people in their beds. Now, this is still New Orleans, and the incarceration rate is still um, more than twice, almost three times the national incarceration rate. Um, but if you look, you'll see the start sharp drop um, in 2005. It's as, as the population in, in New Orleans starts to increase, it goes up a bit, and then it it goes down, and it's kept going down because they have made real efforts by instituting pretrial services, by moving to use citation and release, by cutting the time to charging from 90 days to 10 days. Um, they've really made a dent in how they use that jail. Um, there's a long way to go, and a lot of the conditions there, even though it's a brand new building, are replicating some of the worst problems there. It's not perfect. Um, but it is kind of amazing. We have an office in New Orleans, and to see this happen um, is pretty amazing. Um, this is Bernalillo County, New Mexico, which is Albuquerque. Um, they had a huge overcrowding problem. They were sending people out of, uh, out of the county into other people's, ja other people's jails. They had the federal government breathing down their neck with a lawsuit. So they put together all the stakeholders, they did a lot of analysis, and they started working on their systems. And they were able to reduce their jail population by 41% within three years. Um, and this is my hometown, New York City, um, home to Rikers Island. Um, in the mid-90s, um, there were over, there were about 20,000 people at Rikers Island, in the jail at Rikers Island. There are fewer than 10,000 right now, um, and there is an actual reasonable movement to close Rikers Island, um, and it is believed to be in reach. Um, and that is no small thing, and that is not an accident. Um, some of that is, is there are drops in crime, but there are also changes in policy, specific efforts to say we are gonna do things different, differently. Um, so, Change is possible. Um, change is not easy, um, but um, I believe that, um, and I've seen people all over the country, inside government, outside government, making decisions about how they want their local justice system to work and making the kinds of changes that, you know, overall reduce the amount of human misery in this world, and I think that's a gain. Um, so, mass incarceration is local, but change is possible. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I'm happy to, um, to take questions. And I have a mic that I will <clears throat> run around. I wanted to ask your opinion of private prisons and where they fit into this over-incarceration. Um, uh, private prisons, te uh, there are more private prisons, I think, at this point still than there are private jails. Um, but um, it's a it's boom industry. Um, and I think um, uh, it's a, it hasn't provided anything good. I'll, I'll, I'll put it that way. Um, Am I, am I right? I'm turning to the, the scholar on this. I think that it, um, you know, I, I think what we've, what we've seen is, I mean, it is very hard to know what's going on inside any correctional facility. Um, but once you move, once the owners are private, it becomes even that harder, uh, even that much harder. And whenever we get to see under the rock because of a lawsuit or because of an expose, um, what we see is, is, is even worse than what we see in some of the publicly run facilities. I think I'm going to have a student run this around in a minute. But. Hi. Um, so usually imprisonment is used to both deter criminal activity or take a person out of society because they pose a danger to a community. Mm -hmm. Do you see 
incarceration as, as a sustainable solution to criminal justice issues? Well, that's, a, that's just a small question. Um, uh, I mean, I think we, and I, I wanna first put this in the context of jails because I think once again, the important thing to remember about jails is that most of the people sitting in there have not been convicted of a crime. And so punishment is not a valid use of incarceration for people who are legally innocent. Um, that you can't say the purpose of putting in there is to punish them or the purpose of putting in there, frankly, even is to deter them because they haven't done anything under the law. Um, and there are very, very, we don't generally believe in locking up innocent people in this country. It doesn't comport with our values. It doesn't comport with anyone's idea of fairness and justice. Um, we can only do that under the law. You can under, only do that under very, very limited circumstances. If you believe that someone is unlikely to appear for their court date, or you think um, that they are in some places, some states you can do this, some states you can't, um, they are such a risk to public safety that you have to, that you have to hold them. Um, and most places aren't actually making that determination. They're letting money make the determination because they have a bail schedule or a bail system. The larger question about sort of what is the purpose of incarceration um, is a, a longer conversation and, and, and perhaps when I'm not drinking water. Um, uh, I think um, I think that uh, the role I, I think the role of prisons um, of incarceration overall um, must be much much smaller than it is now. Um, I think it's been shown that um, that prison itself, particularly long prison terms like mandat the mandatory minimums and the the 85 percent rules, the truth and sentencing rules, did not serve as a deterrent to crime. Um, and I think that. Um, there are models of incarceration, not in this country, but overseas, um, that recognize the very limited purposes um, for incarceration. They incarcerate many, many fewer people than we do here, um, and they look nothing like our institutions here, right? I mean, if you go to a prison in Germany, if you go to a prison in Norway or the Netherlands, people wear their own clothing, they're treated like human beings, the entire focus, and, and they're committed, they're sort of anchored in the idea of, of human dignity. Um, that's, and, and the idea is, how do you prepare someone to be successful on the outside? And they live in rooms, they have locks on their own doors, um, they work in kitchens with knives and pan, frying pans, they're treated like um, grown-ups with agency um, who, can, uh, who can make different decisions in their lives. And so it's really hard to think about the purpose of prison in the context of mass incarceration in this country. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be rethinking about it and thinking about the real question is, are there actual circumstances where we think that it's important? Um, I think it's very hard to have that conversation now in, in the context of this country and the way incarceration is used. So I think I kind of dodged that question, but I think I did it kind of well, so I'm okay with that. Sorry, no, that's all right. <laughs> I wanted to ask a question about, um, I guess, helping people re-enter society again. Mm -hmm. um, I read in your report about um, cognitive behavioral therapy and uh, motivational interviews. Yeah. I would love to hear about um, how that is spreading in local jails and state prisons and even if its effects and what that looks like data-wise. Yeah, I, don't, I, I can't reel off data for you. I think it's much more common in a lot of uh, prison systems than in jails, mostly because people tend to stay longer in prisons. Um, but one of the you know, few things that's shown to actually help people change behavior and change the kind of behavior that's considered criminogenic, in other words, leading to criminality, is through um, cognitive, behavioral, cognitive behavioral therapy. And I think, I think it's broadly recognized the extent to which it sort of permeates the criminal justice system depends on sort of resources and the commitment of the people who run those institutions. Um, I haven't seen much of that used in jails. I mean, and, and fundamentally, jails are not correctional facilities, as we know, they're holding tanks. Um, and even the best of them are pretty bad, um, if you've ever seen or spent time in them. Um, and they're not meant to hold people for very long, and what you do, you actually see, is that people spend 
um, uh, years in there, sometimes waiting for a trial with nothing, with no resources, with no programs, with no therapy. Um, and I think um, they're even more traumatized in some ways. And, and often people will take pleas because it means they'll at least get to state prison where some of those resources exist. And yeah. um, you listed solutions to decrease the population in jail as a whole, but what are measures being taken to drop the rate of people of color incarcerated where it's in the, almost in the same ballpark as the white counterparts? Yeah, I think that's a really good important. And one of the things that, um, that's really important to note is that in a lot of places where they have actually managed to reduce the jail population, they haven't reduced the disparity. Um, and I think that that's, um, you know, and, and I think a lot of places think, oh, this is great, we're doing, you know, if we re since, there are so, since people of color are overrepresented, if we reduce the jail population, we're going to reduce the disparity, and, and it's not happening. Um, and we're working with a number of places on this issue, and, and I don't think anyone's done it well yet. I'll be quite honest with you. I'm working um, in, uh, in Philadelphia, um, right now on their jail reduction strategy. And they have um, four different strategies that are specifically targeting trying to address disparity there. Um, one is they, they decriminalized a lot of lower level offenses that people are often sort of entryways into the system where people pick up low level charges and get, um, uh, and then get warrants and then get sort of drawn in. Um, so things like disturbing the peace, things like open container and stuff are no longer criminal, they're civil. It's like getting a parking ticket. Um, they are doing um, a pre-arrest diversion program in two highly impacted neighborhoods that are predominantly um, African American. So the idea is that folks will be diverted by the police before getting arrested. So particularly people who have multiple three, four arrests um, and may have substance use issues. So the idea is not arresting them, connecting them with services. Um, it's based on a model out of Seattle. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing they're doing, which is really challenging, it's really gonna be interesting, is they're doing a very data-driven approach, which is sort of what in the juvenile system has been really critical in reducing some of the disparity in the juvenile system. Um, so they are collecting data on race and ethnicity at all the key decision points that I showed there. So at arrest, the decision to charge, at each of those key decision points, and they're looking at disparity and how disparities changes there, and they're gonna try and drill down um, from each of those points. So um, this is where, you know, is it growing? Is the disparity growing between arrest and charge? What's happening between each of these decision points? And if, if it's going up at one place, what is it about how we are, how we are doing this that's driving that rate up? Um, because it's a really hard thing to get at, I find, unless you start by looking at numbers. Um, because one of the hardest things that, that you can do is walk into a room of people, of criminal justice agencies and say, you know, and show them those Rock County slides, right? Or, or the slides from their county that say, this is your this is your justice system because people get very defensive and they start thinking about all the other causes and all the other things and, and what you have to do is get people to look at real data that's very, they're not gonna solve all the problems in the world in that system, but they can affect how they are making choices um, and whether their policies are having a, a, an intentional or unintentional impact on communities of color. Um, so the short answer is I don't think anyone's doing it well yet um, but I think there are a lot of places that are starting to try. Um, we are working with the Haywood Burns Institute um, out on the West Coast, which has been really instrumental in doing this work at the juvenile level um, and trying to think about how we take the learning from the juvenile justice system and apply it to the adult system. Hi. Um <laughs> uh, so you also said that we can change the way that jails are used in the United States, but um, there is a large history of um, the treatment of inmate or of those incarcerated in jails, of yeah. there being a lot of violence enacted against them, and yep. a very disproportionate rate of people of color dying while yeah. uh, being held in jail. Do yeah. you think that the changes 
that you've talked about of how we use jails, do you think those could have any effect on the treatment of people in jail? Well, I mean, if people, what you want to do is get as many people out as possible and keep them from going in. That's the first part, right? I mean, I think that um, even if you, that most of the people who are in jails pre-trial, the way we run them now, don't need to be there. Right? And so if you get those people out, then they're not being mistreated there. It doesn't mean, I think the issues of people um, being harmed inside jails um, will continue for a while and we need to shine. And that's a separate set of strategies. It's not different, but it's a separate set of strategies. Um, I think, you know, I have colleagues who are specifically working on the issue of solitary confinement um, and the overuse of solitary confinement and working with places to, to look at the same kind of data analysis we use about those decisions are looking, taking apart the decisions about um, how people send some people to solitary and other people not. Um, you know, we're talking about a massive cultural change that needs to take place in the criminal justice system, and we're going to come at it in a lot of different ways from a lot of different points. Um, and I, I think that um, my focus has been really keeping people from going in. Um, but we have to continue to shine a light on what's actually happening inside um, and holding the people who are doing it accountable. So, someone, there's some hands here. Microphone's coming down, so I'm going to let him pick who, gives, who he gives the microphone to. Hi. Um, so how do you see the relationship um, from school to prison pipeline play out specifically in Rock County, uh, if you've looked at it, but also at a federal and state, state level. level. I, I don't, I can't say, tell you much about Rock County. I've, I've looked, I really have just looked at this data um, and so can't say, don't know what the juvenile system looks like, don't look, know what you're... Sort of well, I mean, I think that, you know, there was a big study done in Texas a number of years ago that really documented, I mean, it was, it was like a million cases. It was the first real um, great data evidence of the ways in which um, uh, blacks and black and white kids are treated differently by the um, uh, by the school disciplinary system and the ways in which that school those that school disciplinary treatment sent that ended up sending them meant that they were much more likely to end up in the juvenile justice system. Um, I think there's less. Um, and I think that was, it was criti critically important to document what a lot of people have known and seen, and pe particularly people who work in the system and work in communities on a regular basis. Um, there's a less, at the moment there isn't a study of that size and caliber that really looks at um, schools to prison, um, but there are some smaller ones out there. Um, I don't, I can't say on, on, on Rock County, and I would hate to, I would hesitate to say anything when I, when I don't know what I'm talking about. I, I try and make a practice of that, um, or at least admitting ignorance when I am ignorant. But it's a really important question and one that you should, you should ask and try and get answered from the people who have that information. Can you talk about mental health in the prison industry? Um, because, well, we recently watched the portion of the film, Michael Moore's film, Where to Invade Next and the Prison System in Norway, as you talked yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. And they said the maximum in sentence there is 21 years. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our people in prison, I think, have mental health conditions. Yeah. And how should that be addressed? Because we don't have the um, yeah we don't have the facilities to address that. Right, and I, you know, one of the things um, that I hear regularly when I talk to sheriffs and jail administrators is that they these people they said there's a whole group of people who really who really shouldn't be here, and I don't have the staff and I don't have the resources to treat these people. They have serious medical mental health issues and they don't belong in jail. You know. Sheriffs can't say no to anyone, right? You know, courts send them there, police send them there. They got to take they, the door is always open, um, and but they don't they don't want them. Um, there are there have been a lot of advances in understanding sort of what are the types of things we can do to take to address the issue of people with mental illness who come in contact with the justice system, beginning from first contact. So I mentioned um, crisis intervention training, which is actually pretty widespread um, around the country. Um, there are different models of it. Basically, the idea is to train first responders 
um, particularly when they're responding to somebody who um, has evidence of, of um, having a mental health crisis or is, uh, or is in other ways decompensating, et cetera. It gives them tools to train it or it pairs them with a mental health practitioner um, who can help respond to the situation. Um, there are other, other strategies. There's um, post-booking diversion, which we know a few places that are doing, that as soon as someone's booked into jail, there's a screen that immediately takes place, and there's an effort to get them out as soon as possible to link them with mental health resources in the community. Um, there are mental health courts, um, which are kind of like drug, drug courts. They're problem-solving courts. They identify people through screening, um, sometimes at first appearance in court and be able to say this person doesn't belong in jail. Um, we want to come up with it. It's a sort of a different court proceeding that helps them make sure that they're accountable to the court, but is actually trying to link them, excuse me, with the treatment and services that they need. Um, people still end up in jail um, and, and in prison as well. Um, and jails are some of the worst places for people with mental illness. If you've ever been in a jail in particular, because there's a lot of chaos, there's a lot of noise, um, there's, it's, you know, bright lights. If, if you're um, someone who, who, has, who has lived through trauma, if you're someone who has um, a serious mental illness, you don't have your medication with you, the atmosphere can be, um, can make things much, much worse. Um, and a lot of places don't necessarily have the resources to identify people. Um, and I think the, the mental health and public health community gets concerned when jails get really nice mental health facilities because what judges then tend to do is say, I need to get you treatment, I'm gonna send you inside um, because at least, you'll get, at least I know you're getting treatment there. Um, and so you end up people getting incarcerated who really don't need to be incarcerated simply because you know, they see the treatment and that's where they send them. Um, you know, I think the good news is, is there's, there are a lot of alternatives and there are a lot of places that are doing well with those alternatives. Um, look at Miami, look at San Antonio, Texas, Bear County. Um, there's some model programs there that are worth looking at. Um, and I think it's, it's really, you know, I've talked to, to police officers about this as well and I think, you know, the only institution or the only agency that runs sort of 24 seven in most places is the police. So people call them for everything and people then expect them to do something. Um, and so, and if they don't have alternatives, they bring people to the jail. Um, and the places that do the best job on this have alternative, have other places for police to bring people um, that don't make, that aren't so much harder than bringing them to the jail. Because if it takes that much longer, they're not gonna, they're not gonna do it because they need to get back on the street. <coughs> Other? Uh, you may correct me, but you talked earlier about uh, private versus uh, public yeah. jails. Um, what's the percentage of private jails in this country? You know, I don't know the number. Do you know the number, Professor Weisberger? It's, low. it's low, yeah. And what determines um, uh, how they get there versus? Well, I mean, uh, you know, a county usually has it may have more than one facility, but it makes a decision about how it's going to house people in jail. Do you want to? Yeah, well, a county can contract right. with uh, the private corporations. Counties can, states do, the federal government does. And so it's just a matter of, at that decision-making level, what, the, what choice they make. Right, so that you can decide, you know, we hate our jail, we're gonna, it's an old jail, we're gonna tear it down, um, and we're, not gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna contract with CCA to build us a, a, a new facility. Um, and we're gonna sign a contract that says, you know, we'll keep it 90% filled. Um, you know, when the profit motive comes in, there's a whole different set of incentives that come into play. I think we're Okay, all right, one more over here, unless there's somebody else who hasn't asked. I don't need a microphone, that's fine. <laughs> I was wondering, oh, sorry. Yeah, for the tape. That's fine. Um, I was wondering how many jails, I don't know yeah? if you know, but how many jails like take part in the mandatory labor market? Um, jail, it's harder, you know, we have so much, we have a lot better data on prisons than we do jails, right? Because there are, also prisons. right, well, jails, there are, you know, there are 3,000 of them. 
Um, and so a lot of, there are some that have work programs a lot fewer than prisons, again, because people aren't there very long. Um, there are some programs that have um, work programs as alternatives to fines or fees. You know, you can, you can do service. Um, there are places that where people um, who are in local jails will do the cleanup you know, we'll do city cleanup, groundskeeping, things like that. There's no good numbers on that at all. I wish, I wish there were. Um, you know, I've seen all different kinds of arrangements. Um, there are places, there aren't, you know, prisons have prison industries and there are a lot of, you know, sort of more than just license plates, um, but what used to be just license plates. There's less of that in jails. Again, it's a much more transient population in, in theory. Um, and there's usually no space for a lot of them that are getting too big. There's no space for programming. There's no space for recreation. There's no space for anything. Um, so there certainly isn't that, but it's a good question, though. I'd like to once again thank Nancy for being with us tonight. We probably have a few more minutes. You can come on up. Um, but we need to keep faith with uh, students who have to go out and study. <laughs> Poor things. <laughs>